Right now, the fate of movie theaters rests with one man and one film. Sorry y'all, but I couldn't resist opening this video with my best impression of the movie trailer guy. But seriously, while we're all waiting for Christopher Nolan's latest film, Tenet, to save the movie theaters from the pandemic, I've been re-watching a few of his older films, and I'm guessing that maybe you've been doing the same. But where to start? Somebody's gotta pay, Lenny. Somebody always pays. With Memento... You have to be very careful. You wander around playing detective. Maybe you should start investigating yourself. He's here. Who? The Batman. Batman Begins. Here we go. Interstellar. I started with Nolan's third film, Insomnia. Released on May 24, 2002, this film saw Nolan transitioning from low-budget independent films like Memento to bigger Hollywood spectacles like Batman Begins. But despite its enormous impact on Nolan's career, it ranks lowly on listicles about his films. Why? Is it because Nolan is remaking another film? Most moviegoers have been trained to dismiss remakes, but most of Nolan's films are inspired by pre-existing properties. Think about how his Batman films replace the gothic trappings of Burton and Schumacher's films with the true crime stylings of Michael Mann's Heat. If this Joker guy was so smart, he'd have to bring a bigger car. I'm betting the Joker told you to kill me as soon as we loaded the cash. Or consider how Interstellar pays homage to Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. We used to look up in the sky and wonder at our place in the stars. Now we just look down and worry about our place in the dirt. And how Inception borrows its most spectacular action sequences from Honor Majesty's Secret Service. But Insomnia is a different story. It catches flack for being a Hollywood remake of a Norwegian art film. When the original was released to the United States in March 1997, it played in a grand total of three theaters. Most viewers have seen it through Criterion's excellent DVD or Blu-ray. It's easy to imagine how executives at Warner Brothers could justify greenlighting this movie. I think they were drawn to a morality tale that occasionally evokes Edgar Allan Poe's The Telltale Heart. Ah! It's the beating of that hideous heart! I mean, I think I hear something. Viewers love watching morally compromised characters worm their way out of sticky situations. <laughs> But the catch here is that viewers want anti-heroes to be at least a little sympathetic. Famous Hollywood villains from Darth Vader to Dr. Hannibal Lecter stir our pity with tragic pasts. If villains are completely unredeemable, like the Wicked Witch of the West or Emperor Commodus, Am I not then it's usually because they're long overdue for a spectacularly grisly death. Hollywood's problem with the Norwegian insomnia is that its anti-hero is a total piece of shit who gets away with killing stray dogs and sexually assaulting witnesses. A really, really bad cop visits a small town in Norway that's located so far above the Arctic Circle that the sun never sets during the summer. He's officially there to help local detectives investigate a young girl's brutal murder, but he's really there to lie low while internal affairs investigate rumors that he's been sleeping with witnesses. Things take a dramatic turn when he accidentally shoots his partner and then ends up concealing the crime with some help from the murderer he's been investigating. Oh, and he has trouble sleeping throughout the entire movie because of the bright summer nights. You can tell how everybody who worked on the American Insomnia felt a lot of pressure to soften the dirty cop played by Al Pacino into a tragic hero. Let's compare how the two films introduce this character. From the start of the Norwegian film, we know that the cop, played by Stellan Skarsgård, is up to no good. We start disliking this guy before he starts covering up his crimes and collaborating with killers. By contrast, Puccino's cop is shown taking his work very seriously. Didn't chop her up or burn her beyond recognition. He just thought about what we would be looking for and then calmly removed all those traces. He crossed the line. And he didn't even blink. Plus, he's Al Pacino. How can we not like him, right? Come back from that. 
Skarsgård is little more than an amoral opportunist. Pacino's star power makes Nolan's insomnia easier to watch, but making the character more sympathetic doesn't simplify him. We initially share his anguish that his partner died thinking him a murderer. But the film starts undermining his status as the good guy when he starts lying to his colleagues about what happened on the beach. Oh, the most of what Pacino's character does comes straight from the Norwegian film. His ambivalence and guilt complicate our response to his actions. The film extends this complicated characterization by pairing Pacino with the killer played by Robin Williams. I have a hold over your will, I never did. You made your own choices. Whereas the actor playing the killer in the Norwegian film, Bjorn Floberg, makes Skarsgård's character look halfway normal. I'm not who you think I am. William's public persona complicates our response to the character. In 2002, Williams was best known for projecting manic comic energy into films like Good Morning Vietnam and Mrs. Doubtfire. But that year, two films, Insomnia and One Hour Photo, started contrasting Williams' legendary kindness with darker, more troubled sides of his personality to powerful dramatic effect. I only wanted to comfort her, hold her. Insomnia characterizes William's killer as a man who needs to be liked by somebody else because he doesn't much like himself. The film's best scenes show these two characters, one likably unsettling and the other unsettlingly likable, talking to each other. They never look in the eyes of a killer. Killing changes you, you know that. But life is so important, how could it be so fucking fragile? Typically for Nolan, the staging is a little flat, and some of this dialogue is a little too on the nose, but they still work dramatically because the actors sell the lines and because they evoke so many associations from other movies, even if the film somewhat undercuts this effect with a ridiculous log chase. Both films take place above the Arctic Circle, and the perpetual daylight means the cops just can't sleep. Both films use disjointed editing, oversaturated lighting, and unsettling sounds to represent their distorted thinking. But making the cop more sympathetic changes what this insomnia means on a symbolic level. Since the Norwegian cop is doing bad things just because he can, the omnipresent midnight sun evokes similar existential anxieties about God's absence, the blinding sunlight in Ingmar Bergman's Winter Light. But in the context of the American cop's essential decency, this image becomes more classically moralistic. It reminds us that somebody is always watching what we do, whether it is God, internal affairs, or your own guilty conscience. Pacino's character knows that partnering with a killer to frame an innocent teenager undermines his fundamental beliefs in truth and justice, and he is acutely aware that he is betraying his ideals and becoming what he set out to fight. Let's compare how they end. The unsettling last shot of the Norwegian film simply dares you to meet his cold, unfeeling gaze as he drives away from his crimes. The American film ends with a dying Pacino and warning Swank's character not to betray her most fundamental values. Nobody needs to know. These moments could be metaphors for the film's contrasting methods. If the Norwegian film forces us to confront the cop's murderous gaze, then the American film pulls us into uneasy identification with his guilty conscience. In close, Nolan's film makes the character more sympathetic, but that isn't at all the same thing as making him more simplistic. Rather, the movie's best moments undermine the actor's likability and complicate our responses to their actions.